Good morning, everybody. How we doing? It's good to see all of you here today. More and more people are coming. We're so thankful for that. And uh, Easter might be a really bad idea for one service, but we're going to figure it out, okay? Uh, but uh, hey, uh, excited today because we're going to uh, start a new series called Encountering Jesus. We'll just talk about that here in a minute. Uh, and it's going to be a fun series uh, as we talk about these different stories that, uh, that Jesus uh, interacted with people in. Uh, isn't it fun uh, when when we uh, like brush against like a celebrity, right? Like interact with a celebrity or come across a celebrity. Uh, I remember um, years ago I, I was uh, traveling somewhere and I was in the airport and lo and behold, uh, right across from me was Rick Warren sitting there. And Rick Warren, if you don't know who he is, most of us do, but he was he is the author of A Purpose Driven Life. And I remember sitting there. Now you got to remember as a pastor. Like, in our, like encountering Rick Warren would be like, if, if I were a Catholic, it'd be like, like inter, interacting with the Pope, right? I mean, he was like the guy, right, uh, back in the day. And so I saw him, and I remember sitting there in my seat, and like I had my phone down here, <laughs> snapping pictures, right, and all that whole thing, right? I don't know if I have those pictures anymore, but, right? So, so isn't it fun when we encounter people, even, even if we don't interact with them, there's it's like these snapshots. So uh, let me just ask you, okay, let's, let, let's do a little bit of uh, participation here. I thought about starting on the floor walking around, but I figured that would freak you out, so <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. But, but I'm, let me just give you the chance to say, okay, like name people that you've brushed against uh, that, that, that are famous people. Just, just yell it out. Macho Man. Macho Man. Ma like the wrestler Macho Man? I never would have guessed that someone would say Macho Man. Huh? Shaq? I feel like I'm brushing with greatness with Craig right now. Okay. Yo-Yo Ma. Wow. Okay. What's that? B.B. King. B.B. King. I drove by his bus one time. Does that count? But you guys actually, okay. B.B. King. Who else? What? No way. Who said Bully Joel? Kim? I got to be in a restaurant with him and he played piano for me. Giddy up. Well, how about that? All right. For you? For me on my birthday. Wow. 16. Who else? Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower? <laughs> Everybody under 30 is like, I think he was famous. You know, that's great. Great. Anybody? Who else? Patrick Swayze? Wow. He dead now. You know, right? Okay. Okay. Who else? What? Andy Griffith? Oh, he's a hero of mine. All right, who else? Somebody up here. John Cena. Who? John Cena. Really? Well, giddy up. Okay. Who else? Anybody else? Right, we will keep going, but it's just fun. And who else? Miley Cyrus. Miley Cyrus? I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, right? How about that? All right. Okay. Good. So isn't it a fun? So, so these encounters that we have, even if we don't know them, like it kind of changes our perspective about them, doesn't it? Like you see them and you, like you didn't necessarily, unless you had a music, like they played the piano for you, right? But normally you don't have like an encounter where you're, where you're like talking and sharing life and so forth. It's these little snapshots, isn't it? And it changes your perspective, doesn't it? Like, you're, okay, well, I kind of see them differently because I saw them up close, right? It's kind of what it is. And as we uh, talk about encounters with Jesus, there are people that we're going to look at uh, that uh, had these snapshot interactions, but they weren't just brushes with greatness. They, like, Jesus, like, talked to them and interacted with them. And as we see these encounters, what we find uh, is that, uh, we see a, a, like an inside look at the character uh, of Jesus and how he was just different, right, than anyone else. And then we're going to see how the individuals that interacted with Jesus, they came one way and they left very different, right? And now some of them left without responding to him, but others left and were changed forever. And what ends up happening in these encounters is it challenges us then to say, okay, what is it that Jesus wants to say to me 
uh, today and in my life. So again, snapshots of these encounters with Jesus. And today what we're going to do, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn over to Mark chapter 10, okay? And we see uh, the first encounter that we're going to look at being recorded. And it was this, this encounter with what the Bible calls, describes this young man as the rich young ruler, and if you've been in church a long time, you might know the story, but I think we're going to see things maybe uh, that we haven't uh, thought about uh, over this time, okay? So this was a remarkable encounter that this man had with Jesus, and um, uh, it's just, it's a chance for us to see, God, what do you want to say to me and maybe even my life? Now, let me just talk to two different crowds here today. One is what uh, I call the curious. Over the years, I've, I've talked about people that are curious versus convinced. Curious meaning that uh, I'm willing to, to consider the person of Jesus Christ. And if that is you here today, I want you to know how honored we are that you've come to even listen to anything that, that I would have to say and to be around us today. And here's what I want you to know, that as we look at the person of Jesus, you need to know that I am not inviting you into a religion. I'm not inviting you into a set of rules. I'm not inviting you into a set of just standards that, that, that make you better than other people, but rather we're inviting you to get to know a person, the person of Jesus Christ. And I'm praying that you can interact with him. I'm gonna tell you the truth about Jesus, and then I want you to be given the opportunity to decide what you think. Okay, uh, and so if you're curious, I want you to know that we're so honored that you would come and humbled by that. And then the other group of people that I want to talk to, I want to call the convinced. Those are people, all of us here today, that would be in the category of following Jesus. He he is my Savior. I know him. And then my prayer is is that we would see personally over the next month or so that we would see personally the next click that we need to understand first about the person of Jesus, right? And then second, no, about knowing the person of Jesus, what it means uh, for us to take our next step, our next click, our next yes to him. Okay, get it? Good. All right, so we're going to get right into it. And first thing I want to do, I told you we want to get to know Jesus. First thing we want to do is we want to get to know this rich young ruler in John, or excuse me, Mark chapter 10. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about getting to know this, this young man socially. This young man socially. Over in Mark chapter 10, verse 22, again, I'm going to jump around a little bit in this passage, but you'll see it all come together. It says in verse 22, at this the man's face fell. We'll talk about why it did in just a minute. And here it is. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So translation is this, is that this young man, this rich young ruler, we'll see in a minute, uh, had resources. And in fact, potentially unlimited resources. The Bible says simply that he had a lot of money, right? Uh, he had great wealth. Now, oftentimes people will read this and pastors even will read a passage like this and we're often led to think or make the conclusion that money is bad. Now you need to understand money isn't bad, right? It's a resource. That's all that it is. I remember years ago when my father-in-law taught me that. He said, listen, always remember that money is just a resource. That's all that it is. Uh, it's not moral. It's not immoral. You, you know, it's just a resource. And in some cases we can look at it in such a way that it begins to define us and our attitude toward money and wealth causes us to, to have a bad attitude towards life and arrogance and everything else, right? Selfishness and so forth. But also, money can be used for, for great things, right? So a conclusion from this simple statement that money is bad would be an improper conclusion. Money isn't bad. Money's fine. The Bible doesn't talk against it. It tells us what we need to see it as, Right? The other thing we learned, so he, had, he was wealthy. The other thing we learned is uh, that he was young. Now, 
if you're new to the scriptures, understand this, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are what we call the gospels. And they're synoptic, meaning that they all interact together. And they were all written by different followers of Jesus by the name of the book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? And so they all tell the story of the time that Jesus was walking on earth from their unique perspective. And same stories, we learn a little bit different nuances about them. And over in Matthew, Matthew's gospel of this story tells us that he was young. So he was wealthy and he was young. Now, why did Matthew tell us that he was young? We're not exactly sure. Maybe it was because this man possessed a great amount of potential, right? When you were young, you have great potential. We're also told uh, by Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke tells us in his book in in the story that he was a leader. It says that he was a ruler. So he had influence, I don't know how much impact he had, but he had influence. And so we learn socially that he was wealthy, that he was young, and that he had influence. He was a ruler in the community. So can we just say very clearly as we learn about this man and the the reality of his social reality is that that this guy had an unbelievable power regarding potential. We talk about that in our church, right? We talk about redemptive potential. Now, here's what's interesting, and we'll see this, is I don't see anything in this text that would indicate that Jesus was, and don't miss this, unimpressed with his potential. There's nothing that indicates that he wasn't unimpressed by it, right? But here's what Jesus didn't do. Jesus did not qualify this rich, young ruler by his potential, It doesn't say he wasn't unimpressed. He just didn't qualify him by that, right? You see, we oftentimes, at least I do, I don't know about you, but we oftentimes qualify people on their potential and we end up making a mistake when we qualify them on the wrong thing. You know what? Can I just be honest with you? Some of my biggest mistakes in ministry, both in hiring and even raising up leaders, is making decisions and qualifying them on their potential, assuming, listen, don't miss this, assuming that their character match their potential. That's a bad way to, to make decisions. And I've made decisions that way. Maybe you have too, right? And so let me just give you a little insight into our church. We don't do that anymore because I've made mistakes. We don't do that anymore. In fact, we look over in Scripture and we see well, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Listen to this. Uh, Paul is writing to his young pastor, and he says, listen, he says, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work is, whose work is preaching and teaching. But the scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. And so just quite frankly, uh, a, a pastor regard, that's regarded this way is worthy of a, of, a, of a good salary. And this church has always taken care of me very well. I'm very grateful for you, right? And so understand that. It goes on, verse 19, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. It's a very serious thing. Very serious thing to bring things against an elder in the church. Go on to the next, if you would. Verse 22, and here it is, ready? And this is to, the, to me, this is to, to the leaders. He says, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. In other words, do not qualify people on their potential. Make sure that they're worthy of double honor. Make sure that they're worthy of the respect of the people, right? So Jesus, looking at this rich young ruler, he, he models this, and he simply looks at him and says, it's not that I'm unimpressed with the fact that you're like a really cool guy. I'm just not gonna qualify you because of that. I find that really fascinating. And so we take our time as a church right? When it comes to an elder, our, our goal always is that by the time we recognize someone who's being an elder, who, to be an elder, that means they've always already doing the work of one. They're loving people. They're reaching out to people. They're pastoring people already. They're, they're, like, they're caring for people, right? They're praying for people, all those things. And by the time we, we actually say you're an elder and we lay hands on them, the people of God in the church would simply say, oh yeah, that makes sense. It's an affirmation because they see it already. Because Why? 
Because we see Jesus with this young man looking at him and saying, hey, listen, I don't think what you're doing is bad. I think you're a good guy, but I'm not gonna qualify you on your potential. Make sense? Get it? So the potential this young man had is great, and it is God-given, but it's not the qualifier. Now, listen, this is so important, and we'll bring this around. In fact, if Jesus' disciples, I believe, were put in a lineup, like up here on stage, we're put in a lineup with the rich young ruler, and we had the opportunity to choose the one that we think would be the best follower of Jesus, I don't think any of us would have chosen the disciples. I think we would have chosen the rich young ruler. That's what, make G- what makes Jesus so different and so powerful and so compelling. He doesn't choose who we would choose. He chooses someone different. Now why? Because Jesus understood something that we've already been talking about, but he's understood it to the depth of our soul. He understood that he was our potential, that Jesus is our potential, and he sets us free. How do we know that? Let me just give you a barrage of verses to encourage you. Ephesians chapter three, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to, ready, ready? His power that is at work within us. He is our potential. Go over to Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. He is our potential. Ephesians 2, verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are his workmanship prepared by him. He is our potential. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I choose you and appo- or chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Oh, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will do or, 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 or what's it say, or give you, right, right? Jesus is our potential. And so Jesus looks at this rich young ruler, and it's not that he's unimpressed with his talent. It's not that he's unimpressed with his potential. We don't see anything in the text about that, right, good or bad, but he never uses his potential as the qualifier. Jesus Christ, don't miss this, is our potential. He is our potential. And so we learn that as we look at this story. Our redemptive potential is realized in the foundational, foundational truth that Jesus is indeed our potential. And so Jesus saw right through the designer robes and well-kept person and the leadership ability and simply said, young man, I need to tell you the truth. I need to tell you the truth. So we learn all of that about him socially. Okay, get it? Good, let's move on, getting to know the rich young ruler. Let's look at him spiritually. What we know is, we know that he was humble. We know that he was humble. Go to verse 17, the very first part. As the story opens up, this section, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, here's right, look at this, and fell on his knees before him. He fell on his knee. He knelt before the Lord and asked the Lord about eternity. Now, why is this so important? Why is it so compelling? Here's why. Because most people in Jesus' day, most people, the people that knew better, the people that attended the synagogues, the people that taught and led in the synagogues in that day, they didn't kneel before the Lord and say, God, teach me about eternity. They were trying to trick him. They were trying to remove him. They were intimidated by Jesus. And so they, they had this whole idea of what they were trying to do and what, how they saw Jesus. In fact, if you look at just a few verses earlier, the religious leaders tried to trick Jesus and catch him about this whole subject of divorce and remarriage. In Mark 10, verse two, it says this, some Pharisees came and tested him by asking is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? You see, the Pharisees knew Jesus is teaching already. Jesus already declared what he believed about that over in Matthew chapter five. 
But with pride-driven arrogance, the teachers of the law were trying to discredit him because in Jesus' day, many Jewish people had abandoned the Old Testament teaching on marriage and divorce and viewed it as acceptable and easy. So when the Pharisees came to him, it was loaded with full of, of pride and selfish ambition. But this rich young ruler comes right in the front, right in front of everyone. There, there's no indication that he was far from this or that people didn't keep following him. This rich young ruler comes in, kneels down before Jesus and says in broad daylight, he says, I've got some questions. <laughs> I've got some questions. And he was humble enough to kneel before the Lord and say, I've got some questions. How about us? If you encounter Jesus, like are we humble enough just to say, you know what, I, I'm not gonna worry about what I'm wearing, what I'm doing, like who's around me, but I've really got some questions for the Lord. And so this rich young ruler just bowed before the Lord in front of everyone and said, I've got some questions. So we know spiritually that he was humble. And I honestly, I... I think this is incredibly impressive. This rich young ruler would do this. Like I, I am not Jesus at all, but I've never had anyone in our lobby with you know everybody around me come up and like drop down their knees in humility and say, "Please answer my questions." I'd be like, "Dude, get up! You're weird. Stop it." <laughs> of course, I'm not Jesus, but right. But my point is, we would never do that. But he did. Indicates the humility. It's impressive. What else do we learn spiritually about this man? Uh, he's, he was spiritually sensitive. Some of you have come today and you're spiritually sensitive. Spiritually, look at second half of verse 17. He fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Good teacher, I'm in front of everybody. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Which would have been a question for all of the religious leaders that day, in that day. But he came to Jesus and he asked that. This guy wanted to know about life after death. He wanted to know how to have eternal life. And he wanted to have a right relationship with God in heaven. So let's give this guy props for this as well. He was humble enough to go ask the question. And I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you that this guy seems to be a guy that would rise to prominence in the church. Prominence in culture, prominence in the church. We would probably like him and we would probably promote him. But it gets even deeper. We also learned that he was a moral man. Look at verses 18 through 20. Why do you call me good, Jesus answered, which I think is an incredible response. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You should not defraud, and you should honor your father and money. Uh, and money. <laughs> mother. Mother. Your father and mother. Right? Six things out of the standard for righteousness, the Ten Commandments. Look at verse 20. Teacher, he declared. So it wasn't like a, well, I think I did okay. He's like, teacher, teacher. <laughs> I've done all these things. Right? Since when? Since I was a boy. Now, I don't know if he stood up at this point. But if Jesus said all those things, like, oh, I'm good. He declared it. Love that. Right? He's a moral man. He had a good system of morality. So here's a question for us. How many of us, like if we were doing, saying this to Jesus, how many of us could look at the commandments of the Ten Commandments that Jesus listed here, or the six that he listed here, and be able to say, I've kept all of these? How many of us would be always say, I always honored my mother and father? 
None of us is my guess. Right? Um, I've never told a lie. Nope. I've never stolen. I've never withheld money from the IRS on my taxes. Whoops. How many of us could do that? The young ruler, listen, don't miss this. He was an incredible guy. This guy was incredible. He's a guy I'd want to hang out with. He's a guy I'd probably give a lot to the church. He's a guy that probably had pretty good wisdom. Wise beyond this. This guy had it going on, I'm telling you. But we miss that so many times in the church. Well, we would like him and we would promote him. He was one of those guys, right? Checked all the boxes. If this guy passed away, everyone would say that he was in heaven for sure. His posture socially, spiritually, and morally fit. He was an incredible guy. But Jesus didn't qualify him for that. Isn't that fascinating? You talk about an encounter. You talk about a snapshot. We learn a lot about Jesus in this. But I think this guy is in what I would call, what I refer to over the years as the Matthew 7 line. I think he's one of those guys who would say, yeah, but God, didn't I? Yeah, but God, I did. Yeah, but God, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, but God. Look over Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, speaking of salvation. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform any miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. In other words, in other words, your potential doesn't qualify you. I'm not impressed or unimpressed with it. It's great. I actually, speaking of God, I actually gave you your potential. It's wonderful. But you just need to know that that doesn't qualify you. And we see it right on display before us with the guy, if anybody's gonna make it to heaven, it's him. If anybody ought to be a leader and respected, it ought to be him. He's still a young guy. Imagine if he kept up this life over the next 20, 30 years, he would be the guy that when he opened, the mouth, opened his mouth, everybody would stop and listen. He had it going on but his potential didn't qualify him. It's unbelievable. Right in front of us. And that is why, don't miss it, that is why encountering Jesus is so important. Because what he does is he removes the scales and he reveals the true heart in this man. And when he does that, he reveals it ultimately in us. Now, watch Jesus speak the truth to him, but he doesn't, ready, to please don't miss this, he doesn't do it with a hammer. Watch. We've gotten to know the rich young ruler, and I did all that on purpose. Now let's get to know Jesus in this passage. Mark 10, 21, look over there for me. You'll see this. First thing we see is that Jesus, the first four words, Jesus looked at him, Je excuse me, and Jesus looking at him. That's important. Just, we'll leave it there if you wouldn't mind there, Jeff. Loved him, we'll get to that in a minute, and then said to him. So Jesus looking at him. Let me, let me just describe to you what's going on here. When Mark uses the, this word looking, so it's, we know that the way that it's written, it's, a, it's, it's in the verb form. It's an active, volitional looking at him. And this, this word look or looking in its form that it's in, it's, it's to observe, literally, ready? It's to observe fixedly. That's what it actually says. To observe fixedly. It means to gaze upon. 
And it gives this idea when Jesus locks eyes with this rich young ruler, it gives this idea of a close, penetrating look that communicated something unique. So Jesus looking at him, right? Don't miss it. I believe this was a five-second look when the rich young ruler saw everything around him go away. You ever been in that situation looking at someone and you just lock eyes and they're looking at you and you're looking at them and when they're looking at you, they're communicating something and everything else just kind of fades away and it's just you and him or you and her. You, 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 like, like you ever had that situation happen? I think the rich young ruler all of a sudden began to see the heart of Jesus. And he began to see that everything that was like this big resume that he had didn't matter. He was looking in the eyes of Jesus. Looking at him, go to the next, Jeff. Loved him. And Jesus, looking at him fixedly, gazing into his eyes, loved him. Now this word loved is related to agape. And agape love is God's perfect loves, or per perfect love, and agape serves as a description of God himself. He is love. God is love, right? In the, in the noun form. But here is the word agapeo. And it's in the verb form. And and what it is, it's this, it gives us insight to a love that Jesus not only just had, but actually showed. While he was looking at him, he showed an intense kind of love. John MacArthur describes agapeo this way. He, it expresses the purest, noblest form of love, which is volitionally driven, meaning it's action-oriented. Not motivated, don't miss this, put it in the context of the rich young ruler, not motivated by the superficial appearance, emotional attraction, or sentimental relationship. Agapeo expresses the ideal kind of love, that which is exercised by the will rather than emotion, not determined by the beauty or desirability of the object, but by the noble intention of the one who loves. And so Jesus, looking at this rich young ruler, right, in this moment, when their eyes locked, Jesus was communicating to him that his social status, his spiritual works with regard to the law, his moral commitments, although admirable, are not what Jesus measures for acceptance. It is volitional. It is an action, Jesus saying, that I am taking, I am loving you. I often tell Marcy very, very simply, sweetie, I just love you. I just love you. And it's not tied to what you bring to the table. It's not tied to what, you're, what you do wrong or, or if you hurt me or disappoint me. It's, 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 it's not tied to, to how you dress or how you look or, or, or what happens when we get older. It's, it's not tied to any of that. Sweetheart, I just love you. Get used to it. That's what Jesus is saying to the rich young ruler and what he's saying to you and I. Listen, you just need to know I just love you. And what you bring and what you do and how you dress and what you say and what you've kept in your life, right? All of that, right? Like, that's great. It's great potential. You're awesome. You're, that's awesome. But it doesn't qualify you. You need to know that I am your potential and I am the one that qualifies you. I am the one that loves you. I am the one that redeems you. You are loved, and we learn something about Jesus that we so often just water down and we just push away. It's, does Jesus, oh, God loves me. Oh, God loves you. Don't you, oh, God loves you. No. He just loves you. He just loves you. And because God is so good, because God is so passionate, and because God is so driven to communicate that, he loves us enough not to be impressed with our resume. 
He loves us enough to not look and say, you know what, I know you would pick this rich young ruler over the disciples. I choose the disciples. I, I take what is unwise to shame the wise. Why? Because I am your potential. I just love you. Get used to it. Unbelievable. That's what we learn about Jesus. We, love, we learn about his unbelievable, incredible, life-changing, and yes, this, compelling love for us. You see, one of the reasons I broke down the full picture of the rich young ruler was because I wanted us to see how much the rich young ruler resembles us. I resemble him, and you do too. You're a bunch of good people, most of you. No, you're a bunch of good people. We're just like the rich young ruler. Well, are you nice to people? Yeah, I've done that. Well, are, like, like do, you, do you give to, to the Lord? Yeah I, yeah, I give to the Lord. Well, 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 well do you like, not cheat? Well, I don't cheat. I try not to lie. I feel like I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. I mean, I've got money, right? He's like, well, I don't have any money. Well, most of our houses have, uh, homes have houses for our cars, right? Garages. We have money, right? So we've got money. Like, we're just like them. And Jesus says, I'm not impressed or unimpressed with that. It's fine. It's not your qualifier. And for the curious, that's so important. He just loves you. And we're just like the rich young ruler. Now the convinced, listen, one of my concerns for the convinced is what I said a couple weeks ago. We're praying for revival right now. But what I said a couple weeks ago, the church in Revelation, Jesus said, I, you, you're, you're awesome, but I hold one thing against you. You've lost your first love. That's the thing that he held against him. You're not passionate anymore. You're not compelled to do something for the Lord anymore. You've lost your first love. You've gotten over your salvation. You stopped preaching the gospel to yourself every day. You stopped remembering what Christ saved you from. You stopped remembering what he's done in your marriage if you're married. You stopped remembering how he's been faithful when no one else was being faithful. You've gotten over your first love. And Jesus said, listen, just remember, I just love you. I just love you. Oh, it's incredible. It's life-changing. That's why I think we can understand deeply now Jesus' words in John 8, verse 32, when he says this. Then you will know the truth. That's Jesus. Here it is, ready? The truth, it's a reference to the Lord, will set you free. From what? your resume. It'll set you free from the burden of wondering, of wondering if I'm doing enough. Set you free from wondering if I'm fully loved. Because here's the thing, you know behind closed doors what you are really like inside. You know what you really struggle with. You know your temptations. You know what you give into. And the bottom line, if we were to remove all of the scales and we had some kind of confession time, it would freak us out because we would learn things about one another that we never thought were possible. And Jesus just looks at you and gazes upon you fixedly and he says, listen, listen, I just love you. I just love you. That's what it means to be set free. That's what it means. Are we living free today? I'm learning to do that. I don't know if I'm there yet, but I'm learning. We're free. 
the truth will set you free. It sets us free from legalism. Legalism. Wondering if we've done enough. Wondering if, if Jesus really got down into our soul of souls, our hearts of hearts, and our mind, and the, the thoughts that we think, and the, and, right? All that stuff. He, like, that's somehow going to disqualify me. And so I'm trying to make up for it on some, someplace else. Jesus says, stop it. I'm looking at you. I just love you. Be free. That's what the love of God does. Speaking to my, uh, to dad, to my dad uh, this past week, and um, he lives down in the Carolinas now. It's March Madness coming up. A little bit of a tribute to where they live. Um, but um, we were getting off the phone, and he said, "You know, I, I." He said this. He says, "You know, I know that uh, that you don't like to hear it anymore, but I'm proud of you." I said, "Oh, that's not true." Nobody's proud of me anymore. I'm to the age now where I gotta be proud of other people. And I'm older and he's getting older and he said, I'm proud of you. Right? I think some of you, I think some of you come in and you wonder, you really wonder if you're worth being proud of. You know, I think that breaks Jesus' heart. Because you are. And it's not because of what your potential says. That's completely horizontal. Because here's the thing. If what our potential communicated to God, right, and that all of our, our hiccups and things, like, we're not worthy of being proud of. We, we fall short of his glory all the time, every day, every minute, right? But when he qualifies us, he becomes our father. And he just loves us. Is it possible, is it possible that the love of of God could be so powerful in you today, so compelling today, that you would say, I'm ready to turn my life over to Jesus if that's the kind of God that he is. And could it be possible today that the love of God is so compelling as a follower of Jesus that right now, right here, in this time, your love for him, your first love, is reignited. Oh, because he loves me. Oh, my love for him. I've missed it. I've missed being in love with my Lord. So I'm returning. So I'm going to pray, and, and I'm going to invite you to number one. If you, um, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior today, would you trust Him as your Savior today? In fact, let's just pray right now. I want to pray for you and invite you in your seat to pray with me. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this time today to understand your word. God, I pray for every person here today that has never made a decision for you, and some of them right now are ready, God. They recognize that their resume is, is not what you're after. They recognize that they're sinful people, and they're ready to trust you as their Savior. And so right now, if that is you, friend, would you just in your heart, back to the Lord. If you would say it out loud, you say it out loud. We're real laid back here. But would you just repeat this prayer? Remember, it's not in a prayer. This is an, this is an expression of your heart to simply say, dear Jesus, 
thank you for being my Savior. I ask you today to be my Savior. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart and to make me new. God, I ask you to forgive me for my sin and to cleanse me. I accept you as my personal Savior today. Thank you for loving me, God. Thank you for being unimpressed with my resume, but completely in tune with your love and then the expression of that love for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, if you're convinced here today and you're a follower of the Lord and we're, we're already in the family of God, like we're not praying for salvation. We don't believe you can lose that, but, but you've lost your first love. And so right now, why don't you just pray with me? Dear Lord, forgive me for, for pushing you to the side with life. Forgive me, in, even as, follow, as following you, as a follower of you, Lord, forgive me for getting into the trap of thinking that being a little bit better makes me a little bit more lovable. Being a little bit better makes my, my chances with you a little bit more uh, inviting. For beginning to believe, Lord, forgive me for beginning to believe that because of anything that I have done, my life is better or worse. Forgive me for getting over my first love, which is to understand your love for me. And so, Jesus, I repent. Jesus, I return to you. Jesus, I give my life back to you. God, I want to fall in love with you again. I give you my resume. I want to find the freedom of Jesus Christ that I once had. Dear Jesus, we are praying for revival. We are praying for movement. We are praying for our first love to, to be revived in us again. We're praying for awakening. And God, we're not worried about being on TV. We're not worried about anybody knowing it. We just want as a body of people to be in line with you. And so I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would just come and sweep over this place and that we would enjoy your presence. Come, Lord. Please come. Amen. So we're going to worship now, and we're not going to like get open things up. I mean, it, it's always open. You can come up and pray if you want. But if you need to pray where you are and you'd like someone to pray with you, please take this time to do that. Okay? It's your time. If you made a decision for Jesus Christ and you would like to talk to me or to, I know Sarah's here, I think Pastor Lawrence is here, and anybody else. Um, that you know and trust, tell them the decision that you made. They'll tell us and we'll, we'll help you. If you want to write it down on that connection card and you want to give it uh, in the basket that comes by, we invite you to do that. But this is your time of worship. He loves you. He just loves you. Enjoy that reality today.